welcome everyone. Tonight, we hope to take you on a wonderful journey with us to Afghanistan and back. My name is Douglas Mackey, and I'm joined tonight by... I'm Jody Mackey. And Larry Kirshner. I'm going to be connected with all of you. And we want to help you connect with these kids in Afghanistan and the culture there. So take a moment, feel your breath, and I'll feel mine. And I think I know all of you. I'm really grateful that you're here. You may not know all of you, but know that we're, you know that we're one community together here and that we're here because we have a larger sense of community than the lines on a map. And so I hope at the end that you feel connected to these beautiful people in Afghanistan too. The Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers and the others that we met. So we'll start the introductions. In the back of the room over by the Traditions Library is a map of Afghanistan. These lines were not drawn by Afghans. Uh, they were drawn by a British map maker, actually, the outside of the country. But you'll notice a big trough. This is a you know, relief map, so you can see the mountains. It's very mountainous in that uh, you know, northern two-thirds of the country. And that trough is one of this Silk Road, one of the largest portions of the Silk Road through this part of the world. And in the middle of Afghanistan, on that Silk Road, is a place called Bamiyan. And that's where we spent about half of our trip. Uh, we invite you to stay afterwards. This will probably be uh, a couple of hours where we have some uh, special guests that are planning to join us uh, around 8.30 or so. If, uh, the computer connection is functioning. Um, we'll be able to have uh, some company from Afghanistan um, answer some of your questions. We ask that you uh, hold your questions if you can and, and until then, unless it's something that's just burning. We're talking, for instance, about NGOs. What is an NGO? Non-governmental organization. Uh, otherwise, we'll be happy to answer your questions and, and have a conversation. Uh, at the end of the, the program, uh, that will include Hakeem. Two years ago, several of you here joined Jody and me and the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers in a vigil that took place out on Percival Landing. The Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers had captured our hearts in the matter of an hour, maybe two, of watching their videos, uh, very short, three or four minute videos that explain what it's like to be living in Afghanistan. Abdullah was five years old when his brother put him on his shoulders and they marched out of town up into the woods to escape the Taliban. His father was captured, his grandfather, both of them were killed. They, uh, they returned and through these last 10 years, the, uh, the families of Bamiyan that are working with the uh, Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers have found ways to not be pointing at the Taliban and saying bad and pointing at the U.S. troops or pointing at the NATO coalition or pointing at the other ethnic groups that were historically their enemy. They've learned to invite everyone to the table and that that's how peaceful discussions are entered into. So Abdullah, Nurulai, uh, Faiz, Mohammedjan, Ali, uh, their leader, Dr. Hakim, uh, became our friends. The Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers inspired us to hook them up with other folks. Uh, we were looking for a way of having their peers join us, and I wondered who to go to, and Jody said, well, talk to the Corys. And so I spoke with uh, Greg and Cindy, and 
they suggested that Rachel's teacher, um, Matt Grant, who is now the principal at the local school, would be able maybe to, to help us out. And so um, when 60 students gathered in the library at Olympia High School and heard Abdullah's voice in Dari, something changed in the room. The resonance of his voice from Afghanistan allow, gave space for each of these students to look inside. And it was a vis visceral experience for us. And, and Dennis came over to me a few minutes after that and said, all the adults have to do is get out of the way. <laughs> um, so those kinds of conversations continued and grew and they in, involved the likes of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, Veterans for Peace, many chapters of Veterans for Peace, uh, September 11 Families for Peaceful Tomorrows, the leadership of that organization. Uh, Voices for Creative Nonviolence has taken a particular interest in, in becoming close with the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers and Kathy Kelly, who many of you know about, uh, has visited uh, four times and there have been six delegations from uh, voices that have gone over to Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, it's taken all of those connections to build to the over 2,000 people who know the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers now. And it's taken even some, Rachel, is a big reason that this has grown. And, uh, and Noam Chomsky is. Noam Shkamsi is, is speaking with them. Uh, some of you have heard of Amy Goodman. Uh, others have had a chance to speak with the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Now, it wasn't just enough to know these wonderful, wonderful folks for us to pick up and go over to Afghanistan. When we heard Kathy on one of the phone calls, we um, remember that she had shared with us that Abdullah's mother had a wish list of things. And second on her wish list was clean water. And uh, I'd spoken with uh, Jody on a number of occasions. It would be wonderful to go over and visit. They invited us to come. In fact, they have invited everyone to come to Afghanistan for the International Day of Peace, September 21st. And they've been extending this invitation for, for several years. It was their invitation to come and visit them that was the first thing on the internet that I saw when I went to their website. And um, so when Kathy shared the story about Abdullah's mother expressing the need for clean water, and I mentioned this to Larry Kirshner, a friend of mine, who was over to read poetry on one of these global days of listening, which essentially has been established by the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. And, um, it's not our idea. We're helping with it, and it's an honor to do that. But when I asked Larry about um, going over to Afghanistan, he said, yeah, um, yeah, let me think about that. Larry? When, when Doug uh, talked about it, I, I said that I didn't want to be what I call a political tourist. I wanted to do something useful. And in the summer of 2000, I went to Iraq with uh, Kathy Kelly and Voices in the Wilderness. And the biggest issue in Iraq at that time was the fact that 5,000 children under the age of five were dying every month because of dirty water that was specifically and intentionally caused by the United States. Um, when we were in a hospital in Basra, the doctor in the hospital warned us not to drink out of the drinking fountains in the hospital because it would make us sick. There were children dying from diseases that would have been easily cured. So water became an issue for me. And then I found out about Afghanistan and the, the figures vary and it's hard to know exactly what the truth is. but well over three quarters of the households in Afghanistan do not have clean water. The, lead, the uh, leading cause of death of children in Afghanistan is diseases that are a result of dirty water. 
I read the one of the UN uh, statistics said that in Bamiyan province only 8% of the households have clean water. So it, it was an issue and just about the same time I heard about uh, Friendly Waters for the World. They were doing a training session here in Olympia on how to produce biosand water filters which is a low-tech inexpensive water filtering system um, that is relatively easy to make, has no maintenance particularly, no parts to break, is good for 30 or 40 years with minimal uh, attention. And it gets rid of 99.5% of bacteria, water, and pro uh, viruses, and protozoa. We have a, a small model of the, of the system back there on the table. So, uh, Doug had previously taken the training on how to uh, make the, these uh, water filters, so I did, and that's we decided we would go and meet the, these wonderful kids that we met on the internet, and at the same time do something useful rather than just go and be tourists. So we land in Kabul and go on the most insane roads I've ever been on. Kabul used to be the Paris of the Middle East until 20 years ago after the Soviets left. They hadn't bombed Kabul. The, there was a civil war among the warlords and 98% of, of Kabul, we heard, was bombed. And so everything that's there has been repaired and built up from there. There's rubble everywhere. So much rubble that it's like my mind couldn't, couldn't believe that that's what it was from. Um, and, and so we went to Dakar. Dakar is the Danish Committee for Afghan Relief. And we're driving up once again in this, in, I mean, we're talking 11 lanes down to four lanes, no street lines, no stop signs, with mules and, or donkeys and carts pulled by men and no one seems to slow down in potholes everywhere. So that it was wild. It was very exciting to be on the roads. And we pull into the car. The car looks rubbly on the outside with little shops on every wall. And we pull in and they look for bombs using mirrors underneath our car. And once we go through the second gate, there's flowers and beautiful lawns and beautiful people greeting us. And we go up to the top and they're working on sewage and water. And they've worked for 27 years with Afghan refugees. And I've heard from Afghans here in the States and in Afghanistan what a wonderful job they're doing. So they were actually going to do the training for us in Bamiyan. And Douglas was going to bring them a GIS system and the training to use that to make their work more effective. So for the next three or four days, Douglas spent most of his time there. And Larry and I were taken to Rastagar carpets, which are working with the poorest returning refugees to make these beautiful carpets out of natural dyes and hand spun wool. And, and they're in two years turning it over to the people who are making the carpets. It's not just an NGO, it's um, which gives to people, it's really empowering them. Um, and we also went to a women's group, the Afghan Women's Skills Development Center. These women started nine years ago as refugees in Pakistan, really poor, but they had a vision for how women could be treated in Afghanistan. There, many women never talk to anyone outside of their families. They spend their lives in their half of the house and in the fields, and when they go anywhere else, they're in a family group. So we, we learned a lot in Afghan, or in Kabul. I did want to start to share some of the uh, photographs with you that we took along on the trip. And many of these were taken by the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers too. So uh, and Larry and I, Jody, took some of these. Um, in, um, in Dakar, we um, met with their staff These are, um, is this Joe Whitten? He's one of their GIS operators. Um, Azim is standing 
and, and talking to the other staff in the GIS uh, office. Um, Mohammed uh, was the greeter, and another gentleman who um, has several names, uh, Mohammed was the uh, person who took care of me um, in the um, guest house. And there, these are the cooks uh, from the guest house area, and uh, just wonderful, uh, wonderful people, uh, primarily Pashtun, uh, that were working there. Uh, in the Dakar setting, although Tajik, Uzbek, um, Hazar, uh, the staff uh, was uh, very, um, uh, very open and wonderful with each other. Uh, they uh, helped me learn Dari, and well, wait, the Pashto word for that is also this. Um, Dari was the language used in Bamiyan. And so that's what we um, uh, learned uh, before we went, and, and uh, we learned it while we were there as well. Some of us less than more. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they were very patient with us in, in, their, in our lessons uh, about Tari. Uh, and while I queue up the photographs of the, um, uh, the efforts that we uh, made in, in Pato, Peto Lopman, um, I'll turn it over to Larry and Jody. Um, we, we learned uh, quite a bit from Dakar. They've been involved in water issues in Afghanistan for, uh, like Jody said, 27 years. One thing that they said that really struck me was that in the last 10 years, the water table in Kabul had dropped 20 meters. And in the last year, it had dropped a full meter. A full meter in one year. So you can imagine what that means if you have a program of trying to make uh, get clean water to folks. Um, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, let's see, another NGO that we uh, met with and talked with is a, a bunch of young photographers who have a group they call Third Eye. Um, they're photojournalists, men and women. Um, who have produced several uh, photographic books of life in Afghanistan, gave us a copy. They are trying to find a venue to uh, do a tour here in the United States. Um, they have some funding for that, but they need places to go. Um, I've tried to hook them up with a few people that I know. In Dakar, we got to speak for just a few minutes with a woman who's running their Women's Skills Development Center. And they go in um, to a community and bring five villages together of women to learn carpet making and tailoring. And they only support these villages, these centers, for two years. And then the women have to be able to support themselves through this. So I, I mentioned earlier that many of the women in Afghanistan never get to talk to their neighbors. How could they possibly bring five villages of women together? And so that's part of the healing of what we saw there through the, that skills training center and the Afghan Women's Skills Development Center. One of, uh, who do similar work, one of their uh, centers that they created was in one village, but they had to have five centers because of the different families that couldn't communicate. So they brought the men together for a four-day training. And the men the first day said, we don't have time for this. But somehow they were there anyway. I think they were being paid to be there, so they actually showed up. And then the second day they said, we still don't have time. Can we make it shorter? And the third day they said, can't we make this longer? And all of them showed up for the fourth day. And after that training, they had one center. They learned to trust each other. So that some of the women that, oh, and in the Afghan Skills, Women's Skills Development Center, there's, do we have pictures? There, there, oh. There. She's behind you. Mary. This is Maria Krami. She might be the most, well, we met so many courageous people there. She's gone into prisons to rescue women who were doomed. And she's the, like, was the first person ever to do that. They have started the first women's safe houses in Afghanistan and they started in Pakistan 
Tony, you said doomed. Yes, women who were doomed, who would would not make it out of jail alive because of, of. Um, you have to remember this is an extremely conservative, fundamentalist, patriarchal society. Women essentially have little to no rights or value, um, and we hear about people here starting safe houses and think that's a that's a good deal, but if you think about starting a safe house in a culture where women have no value, where women cannot complain to anyone, it, there's no redress. So the fact that Mary was able to start these houses in that society is an incredible thing. And she was effective enough that she actually got President Karzai to endorse what she was doing. Um, I mean, it sounds like a simple thing, but in this setting, it's it's an incredible accomplishment. Can you talk about bud? Yeah. One of the customs in Afghanistan is called bud. Bud, B-U-D. And say there's an accident and someone is killed, a man is killed. It actually wouldn't matter very much if it was a woman, but a man is killed. Whoever's responsible for that, this man who's responsible, one thing that can happen is that then a cycle of revenge happens and he's killed. Another thing is that the jirga, the local community leaders, can decide that his family has to pay a lot in animals to the, to the bereaved family. But what usually happens is that a girl from this family is given basically as a slave forever to the bereaved family. And you might think that this would begin to repair Fences, but it doesn't seem to do that. Instead, the family gets from the the family heaps abuse on that girl, which doesn't help them heal. And she's a constant reminder of the man that they've lost. And so Mary Akrami is working on eliminating Bud, and she's doing that through trainings of elected officials, including President Karzai. So one of the things we heard is that every family in Petal Lachman, they're internally displaced peoples, they used to be refugees, this is the land that was given to them, and all of them have intestinal issues. And so this is where we got to bring this training. And, and there, uh, Abdullah was helping Douglas up the steep cliff. And that was Larry, <laughs> sea level lungs trying to acclimate to the 10,000 feet. <laughs> you will continue to see uh, the photographs in the background of the training that Shir Habib had started for us. Um, and the uh, slide will come up when a single uh, individual looking very uh, proud and um, looking right at the camera. Uh, you'll know that this is the leader of Pay Talk Wachman when you when you see that and uh, you can you can go ooh and we'll uh, confirm that that's him. Uh, the um, Dakar organization was was willing to send a translator and a trainer uh, who spoke Dari to Bamiyan with us. They had not done a lot of work in Bamiyan province. Uh, Dakar had not, and so we made arrangements for Shir Habib to go and be there on Monday uh, to start the training because we would be coming in on Sunday on a flight donated by the Un United Nations. So we, so we thought. The United Nations policy had changed just a few weeks before our applications for this use of their uh, UN Haas, their humanitarian air service, um, was unable to take us on the complimentary tickets through your generous donations, we were able to have enough to purchase tickets, but we had to wait a couple days to make the flight into Bamiyan. Um, it, driving on the roads was not an option. Uh, it's not an option for the Afghan people at this point either, to drive on the roads to see their relatives in the province next door. We'll speak more about that later on. So when we arrived on um, Tuesday evening, uh, we got ready, oh, that's, that's a classic photo, the two glasses and the smiles on the faces of everyone there who had worked on these uh, filters to, for two days, kind of, you know, knowing that they were probably going to be good. But, uh, and um, there's the group. And Shir Habib is, uh, is on the ground, and behind him is uh, Ali Jumal, 
uh, Ali Juma is the uh, provincial, excuse me, the uh, village uh, council leader. And uh, he was the decision maker uh, that Faiz, Faiz John, one of the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, and in the photographs to Larry's uh, uh, on the piano, on the far left is Faiz Ahmad. And, and the far right. Excuse me, far left. The other left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the, close to the street is, uh, is Faiz. And Faiz went up ahead of time, uh, months ago actually, when we conceived of this project, to find communities where they needed clean water. Many of the villages have been designed and located because of the presence of a, you know, a creek that comes right out of a spring. Um, and there are a few wells that have been drilled. There are more that are being drilled now. But uh, Peytok Lockman and a number of other um, uh, <laughs> A number of other uh, communities in, in, near Bamiyan Center only have dirty water uh, from the um, stream that's adjacent to this cliff, as you saw. So they have to walk up well, probably a quarter mile from the bottom to the top. Seems a lot longer than that. And um, we were very fortunate to um, have made it for five our friend, to have made the contact, find a community willing to have uh, this training come in, and fortunate to have Shir Habib there to, um, to start the training and get it going. We were a little concerned when uh, we got a call from Hakeem. Uh, he's just not really sure he wants to stay in the hotel that he's supposed to stay in. And, uh, um, so we didn't really know how wonderful Shir Habib was till we got there and saw him elbow to elbow with the Afghan people that he was, he was on the road traveling and needed to be in a, a, a place that offered some of the, um, uh, not just comforts, but some of the utilities that another hotel could offer him. Uh, so maybe other thoughts about the work with Peto Blockman. We have a lot we can share with you about the clean water needs. Um, I'm gonna let Larry describe the um, uh, the contract that we, we developed, and I'm going to actually pull out the original contract, and we'll share that with you as long as we get that back. We, we had originally hoped to maybe build a dozen or so filters while we were there, but it turned out that our timing, we were there in the midst of harvest time, the wheat and potato harvest, so they did the training, it was four days of training, they were able to make a couple of filters during that time. But we had two, the two molds that we were intending to leave. Um, and when that idea got around the community there, then the questions began, who's gonna own it? Who's gonna have access to it? Who's gonna control it? And so that was, even before anything occurred, it was gonna start to cause friction. So with uh, Hakim and Nuralai's help translating, we had a, a long discussion with the village leaders and came up with the idea of giving the two molds to the province, the people of the province of Bamiyan, in the care of the village council of Pental Lachman, and they could do any of several things. What we hoped they would be able to do would be to find individuals who wanted to create a business making these filters low cost, make them available, and just rent the, the rent of molds from the, from the village. That way the village as a whole would gain some income, people would have access to the filters, somebody would be able to make a living. Um, unemployment is 60% in, in Afghanistan. Um, it would also help engender some self-reliance among the people. One of the problems with Afghanistan and most third world places where there are a lot of NGOs is the people with good intentions come in, lots of money for various projects, and it has changed the cultures of these places so they become reliant on the projects rather than figuring out for themselves how to solve the issues. Um, so we hoped in a small way to be able to start turning that, that around. Um, 
by creating this situation. So we, we came up with this contract, which we thought would be, um, hopefully be a model for other situations like this. Toward the end of our stay in Bamiyan, we were able to meet with the um, uh, provincial uh, health minister, uh, chief physician in charge of, of working with the community people. And he was listening to the description of this contract and this arrangement with uh, the community with this interesting kind of look on his face. Um, huh, you really, really are trying that here, aren't you? And he disclosed to Hakeem, and he kind of looked at us surprised that, wow, I mean, he, kind of, he kind of likes this idea of community ownership and, and uh, he wasn't, he didn't, they didn't know each other yet. Hakeem is uh, very aware of the um, this political structures in Afghanistan and sometimes even the health ministry can have um, political issues with, within it. And so he was delighted. Hakeem is a medical physician himself, he's a medical doctor. And um, uh, you could see the excitement as Hakeem was talking more and more with this uh, uh, health minister for, for uh, uh, Bamiyan province. So you can see uh, the, the uh, involvement of the uh, villagers of Peto Vakman and their questions and answers. The gentleman on crutches that you see on the left um, is um, Nazaros. And uh, Nazaros uh, is using crutches um, uh, because he has uh, two prostheses. And um, there were many people we saw on, on crutches here and there. Um, this was because of uh, um, a landmine that uh, he had stepped on. That from he, the, uh, Nazaros had been a policeman and he had been a policeman and he was patrolling around um, a, basically an old city that's called the City of Screams or City of Noise that has a long story relating back to Genghis Khan but th there were a lot of landmines placed there uh, by the Russians and um, he had stepped on a landmine while he was doing his job and lost both of his legs. So, There are more landmines in Afghanistan than any other country in the world. They aren't as dense as in Laos because Laos is so small. But So one and a half million people in Afghanistan are amputees. Um, out of how many million? 23, 23 million. Oh, in Afghanistan? Yeah. 28, 20, 20, 28. 28. Yeah, 8 million. 30. So we didn't, we kind of jumped from Kabul to Bamiyan. We didn't tell you about getting there. We, uh, we needed to take the flights once again because the roads are so dangerous. Why are the roads so dangerous? Our military pays for safe passage and they aren't paying Mary Akrami and the Afghani peace volunteers. They're paying the worst of Afghan society for safety. They're paying the warlords and the talibs for safety. But for those people to keep getting that money, the roads have to be really dangerous. So they make them really dangerous for the ordinary people of Afghanistan. Last spring, there was a woman who went in a delegation and she'd been in Iraq and she'd been captured in Iraq, but she had ran been ransomed. And so she did research into the differences between Iraq and Afghanistan and being captured. The difference is, in Iraq, you have a chance of getting out. So, um, last July, we were talking to the boys through Skype, the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, and they were reeling. They were reeling because there had been a kidnapping in front of them two days before, and that man had been delivered to the police and he wasn't alive anymore. And it was difficult. So it was just a couple of cars in front of where the boys were traveling. They knew it could have easily been them too. Well, we didn't know the whole story till we show up in Bamiyan. Uh, Laura Bush had been there many years ago and she promised to pave the main road and all this money flooded in and all this money disappeared and so there's uh, the leader of the provincial council there, Jawad. He had two years ago filled a dump truck full of mud and pretended to pave the main street as like a 
like, where is this money? Who's not? He was doing, you know, a protest. And, and so the, many of the regular people really supported him. Well, it was Jawad who was on the road in front of them and who got disappeared. And, and the boys knew that no one would do any research into that. No, there would never be any charges. In fact, two years ago, President Karzai came to a meeting. They were going to talk about res, uh, restorative justice. And instead, he ended up passing a complete amnesty law for all past and future war crimes. The US said, we're a little concerned. And that was all the response that there was. So when this happens, nothing happens, except that the people are a little more afraid and don't take the roads. So a couple of days before we, two days, two days before we got into the country? Or before we flew? Two days before we were going to go. Two days before we went to Bamiyan, two German aid workers were disappeared that way. Um, so the thing is that the only people who can take flights are those associated with NGOs. If we hadn't been associated with Dakar, we could not have taken a flight. Ordinary Afghans can never take those flights. And so, luckily, we were associated with Dakar, but everybody who could take a flight was taking it then. They weren't taking the road. So we actually missed the first day of the training. We didn't get there on Sunday. We, drove, we flew in on this beautiful day. And you fly into this long valley, and Hakim is pointing to the different branches off of the valley. Oh, that's where Abdullah lives. And over here, that's where Faiz lives. And that's where, I mean, they walk hours and hours to reach each other's homes, uh, this tight community that we walked into, the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. And, and then you start to fly into Bamiyan Center, and there's this, this cliff wall pockmarked with these caves. And then you see where the Buddhists were, the tallest standing Buddhists in the world that the Taliban destroyed 10 years ago. Well, they were carved into a cliff. So they took them out, and there's still these Buddha-shaped holes where the Buddhists were. It's kind of like they're still there. And there's still all the structure that was around them. So while we were there, we climbed up and through and gathered feathers. And, um, and so we fly into Bamiyan, and Hakim's sitting behind me, and as we're landing, he reaches through the seats with his voice to my heart, and he says, Jody, I'm home. He's actually from Singapore, and it's so dangerous to be where we were going. There's been so many threats, including his apartment being burned by the three major police forces in the region. And do you know what his response was when that happened? He went to all three of them, these police forces, that there are some good people in there, but they are also the groups that do disappearances. He went to them and he said, this is ridiculous. Look, I'm an open book. You can read anything. You can join me in any meeting. You don't have to do these silly things like burning my apartment down. That's who we got to be with, was Hakeem and these boys who are so, graceful and courageous in the face of things like that. So we fly in, and there's five boys waiting for us at the end of the UN runway, and we get in the car, and we go eat, and we go to the apartment, and the first, after that, or not the apartment, the little room, the $10 a night hotel, and then we go to the Peace Park. The Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers have created a peace park in Bamiyan, and it's a block long, and it looks like this. They've planted trees. This, they've gotten the city to water it. When I was feeling down, I would go there and pull weeds. There were students who were sitting, male students. I didn't see any women students there. Uh, studying and chatting. And there was a volleyball game happening on the end of it. Volleyball is popular there. This was our first night. Some of you will remember that this is the uh, Peace Park that's in their videos, particularly this, this sign, which has evolved since uh, in the two years since we've known them. The um, saying, uh, why not love? And even a little of our love is stronger than uh, the wars of the world. 
um, is written in uh, their uh, Arabic characters in Dari. And then um, the other side uh, in English um, looks a little like this. Oh, that would be. He did an etching Aww. of it. Uh, Fies, who helped, uh, who actually did the rubbing of this with a uh, little tiny pencil we found at one of the stores that was wondering what, what we meant. Charcoal? Charcoal? What that? And um, they have been working on that sign uh, and repairing it when it's been um, <coughs> vandalized. Uh, someone had thrown paint, red paint on it uh, to make it look like blood and they would clean that off and repaint it. And then most recently, something's happened to the dove. And I'll let Jody tell the story because <laughs> she's got that smile on her face again. So you see the dove has a broken wing. Well, Douglas has a missing leg. <laughs> so we heard in a talk one time, you know, the boys said, oh, we'll wait till Douglas gets here. He'll fix it, or he'll he'll tell us what to do about it, and and they just got to see Douglas got to talk about. It. No, sir, tell him what you're saying. It was it was pretty interesting because uh, they were looking for some sort of solution to the the broken wing of the dove, and I oh, I'm thinking back to gosh maybe there's a song we can reference, and there is a song if you remember it, cackle me afterwards, La Colombe was back in the 60s, I think. It may have been Judy Collins, but, and the, the, the lyrics are, the dove has torn her wings, so, no, no, da, 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 da. So, tackle me afterwards. So, through music, through something, we can find a way. And, but when we were there, um, it was just, you know, five or six of the closely knit uh, Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, and I said, well, you know, I'm still, I don't always feel whole, but that's something I've had to learn, is that even though I've lost a leg, I am whole. And they have a prosthesis, so we could make a prosthesis, and they would translate it, and could make a prosthesis for it. What would you do? You would take clay and get the impression of it, and go back and talk to the guy who made this one. And, but maybe it's okay if it stays the way that it is, because sometimes the stories that you share about what happened can help other people learn what you've learned. So, and there were little moments like this throughout this trip, just little golden human moments where you'd have this exchange that was so precious you just to find a way to share it. We are tonight. The uh, Peace Park was purchased uh, through the efforts of Hakim and some of his friends in Singapore. You won't hear that story from him. He probably doesn't want me to share that with you now. But, uh, and it has been cleaned up. And they've invited people. The uh, provincial governor, the only female provincial governor in Afghanistan, was there to help clean up the uh, rocks in, in this park so that plants could be planted. It's a little jewel of a place. It's where the tent was two years ago when we were out in the cold out here. That's where they were staying, is right in front of... Uh, where the, where the sign is now. It's also the place they hold their meetings. It's also the place that they spoke with Yaniv and uh, Basim from uh, Combatants for Peace. Um, it's where they've held a lot of the phone call conversations from. So it's a very special place, this, this Peace Park. And um, then we went up to Paytok Lokman. And then uh, from there we got ready for the uh, Days of Peace, uh, Global Days of Listening, also called Days of Peace early on, and I'll uh, let you guys introduce this part of it. When you, when you do the Global Days of Listening on this end, there's always some kind of technical problem. You know, Dennis is amazing keeping things going. But when you're on the other end, and you realize that this, on their side, it's all being done on a cell phone, at a place where there's only four hours of power a day. You'll see some pictures where part of the time we were doing this by candlelight. 
and to be in this situation and talk with Noam Chomsky for half an hour, it was it was beyond surreal. <laughs> and it, I, th I think we'll probably see one of the short videos we wanted to show you, where it shows how the boys work, their process. Um, someone asked them a question on, on the Global Days, and Hakim translated it to the boys. Then they had a discussion. There was questions among them defining what their, what their answer was, and then Hakim translated it back. And you can see that Hakim is their mentor, but he's not directing them. He's drawing wisdom out of them as a group of people who have survived living in a war zone their whole lives, and yet somehow they've come to the realization that nonviolence is the only actual solution. Um, their theme is why not love? And somehow, I mean, they've learned to love their enemies, basically. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing to, to see this process go on among these kids uh, who are just full of this incredible wisdom. So this, this is one of the short videos. It, it really was remarkable to see um, the folks huddled around this phone. And I think before we, we show this, I'd like to read um, a very short uh, part of a poem from David Smith Ferry, who's um, one of the uh, co-coordinators of um, Voices for Creative Nonviolence. Um, he describes in the first two stanzas the scene from the hotel where we stayed. And uh, we'll need to find out whose room it was. It was either it was I probably think it was mine because I had the broken window. Okay. Yes, oh, that's oh, right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, he might have been closer to. Me. Uh, so this this is a uh, bit of a hint of what it's like. In Bamiyan City, in plain view of mountains, in a small room on the second floor of the Zuhak Hotel, above the bazaar, above the noise above a steady flow of donkeys and bicycles and NGO trucks, smoke and smell of roasting kebabs, climbing in through the hole in a window, four Afghan youth huddle around a single cell phone. They lean over each other and out of their bodies they build a tent, a place apart. Within it, they open a flap and welcome Anis at the Rachel Quarry Center in Gaza. And through a Skype connection, connect, uh, initiated in the US, his voice enters the room. Our house has been bombed four times, Anis says. We have often slept wearing our shoes. 14-year-old Abdullah responds, Anis, the situation here in Bamiyan is better than in Gaza. Bamiyan is more secure than other Afghan provinces. Kandahar would be similar to Gaza. All occupations, Anis says, are the same. I understand Abdullah's response. My family ran from the Taliban. My father was captured and killed by the Taliban. Like a fire built from wet twigs, the smoldering connection with Gaza smokes and sputters and fails repeatedly. One after another, the Afghan boys lean over and speak into the small phone blowing on the coals, repeating their messages again and again until they get through. They're closing the conversation now and a niece is told by Ali, please remain strong and brave. We will endure this together with you. If it's beyond enduring, please call us. Life will pass, but if it's beyond enduring, call us. We will always be with you, Abdullah adds. Please call, never lose hope. We share our pain. We share your pain, says Golamai. Please don't give up. 
And Zekrula closes the conversation with, please take care of yourself, Anis. So these conversations, um, are, it's, it's, you know, you, you, on this side of it, it's, as uh, Larry mentioned, we're you know, with computers and we're able to line up the Skype calls and use a database to see who's going to be next and Cindy or Craig or people here in uh, traditions, uh, Bernie, and many of you have been part of these conversations. Um, and, it's, and you imagine a cell phone on the other end. I mean, that was how we spoke to them from the high school, was cell phone to cell phone. But you really don't get the feel for it until you're there and you see the magic of this little tiny fuzzy sounding cell phone. You can barely make out what people are saying. Not only is Hakeem an excellent interpreter, but he's got great hearing because there were, we couldn't understand the English that, that he was able to understand. So at the beginning of each global day, there's some sort of thematic thought or, or direction that we're going with um, that, that the Youth Peace Volunteers have asked us to promote. And here's Hakeem's opening um, words. Yeah, that's right. It sounds as if this is civilian torture method, isn't it? You basic autonomous guys, large illusion by killing. Uh, the US ambassador recently, Ryan Corker, had said that the Taliban needs to feel more pain before they can negotiate. To us, it sounds as if this is civilian torture method, isn't it? You basically uh, torture people or kill people as much as you can till they're willing to talk. Uh, it doesn't make sense at all, but uh, this is how the world seems to be operating now. And certainly in Afghanistan, that certain <laughs> culture of uh, resolving um, problems through uh, violence and through a military way has been tried again and again and again over decades. And it has not worked. People are tired of this method and want an end to the war. Uh, the international community, in order to express genuine solidarity, needs to put other non-military and non-violent options on the table. And sad to say, we do not have either an Afghan leadership a strong united Afghan leadership or a strong united Afghan population to be able to put that on the international table. And we certainly do not have the global international political leadership to explore that. Uh, that leaves us with few options except uh, to be encouraged by what is happening across the Middle East and uh, through the peace groups that there are multiple peace groups that we see across the states and in, in, in Europe and in Australia that have been in contact with us to come together um, and, um, and speak together with one voice to put those non-violent and peaceful options on the table to provide the leadership that governments are not providing, uh, a leadership that people desperately need. Uh, that, that will involve many, many years, and it will involve multiple uh, disciplines, um, many civilian approaches, conversations that need to take place before we can get there, but we should, we should start and realize that the options that we have explored so far are not working. They have such a long range plan. Here we are talking about 11 year olds, 15 year olds. We haven't told you how hard their lives are. You know, they wear all used clothes that Hakeem usually brings from Kabul. They probably won't have really enough food or definitely not enough heat to make it through the winter. You know, these are their lives. Right now, potatoes are being sold for, they, they're, they grow potatoes. They get one dollar for about 15 pounds. And um, so here he is with these boys who have lived through so much. Fais, we'll go back to Fais. He's Tajik and Pashtun. And he saw his brother killed when he was seven years old in front of him. 
And then most of the other boys are Hazara. See, it's a Hazara region, um, and they look more like they're from Mongolia. And so they're distinctive in Afghanistan. There are many, there were red-headed people, the people who looked like me, except usually with more olive skin. Uh, and blonde babies, there's such a variety in Afghanistan. Um, but the Tajik and the Hazara, traditionally, while they live in a similar region, haven't been friends. And 20 years ago, when the Civil War started, it was a battle between the two. There's more Hazara, but the Tajiks were the ones who were armed. And so the Hazara boys, like Abdullah um, and Ali, how could they have Fais in their midst, or Muhammad John? And so that's part of the healing. It, it started right there in this group. They're brothers now. They will, they will do everything they can for their brothers. Yes? So how many kids are you talking about? Well, there's actually just 14 in the group right now. There have been more. Uh, and some of them have fallen out because they, they've chosen other paths. Like w one man who was part of the group, he's become a police officer, and he cheated on his uh, entrance exams. And so they, they just kind of don't have, they, they're like in integrity in everything they do. So he kind of took himself out of the <coughs> Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Um, we need to also mention that um, in order to access certain things, um, you, you end up making a decision to compromise principles. Uh, for instance, if you want to have something travel around Afghanistan by a truck, uh, we uh, trusted Dakar to ship the uh, molds for us. Uh, but it's, it's not uncommon to pay for safety, for safe passage. Uh, and sometimes some of those funds end up in places you wish that they hadn't. You don't find out till later on. This gentleman that um, compromised his own principles to get into this particular school um, cheated, but essentially everyone who, had, who got in had, had to do that. Cheating, um, bribery, is a part of the educational system. It's systemic there. So I'm going to give that a little context. And then when we're ready, we'll um, share um, a, a few more of the um, Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers um, uh, tell, tell conversations. Tell story, because that's another reason some of the kids yes. are not in there yeah. anymore. Um, some of you may remember Ali from the videos, his voice was louder than the others, and it would ring out, and he would say, you know, sur, sur, which is the word for peace, when others were saying it with less vigor. Uh, but that was Ali. Um, and Ali had not been in some of the recent videos, and we didn't really know why. And, um, Jody will tell you a little bit more about the wedding that occurred at Ali's house. Um, we figured he was there because of all of the uh, festivities we were invited uh, over and we did attend a uh, portion of the wedding um, and Ali was sort of seclusive and reclusive that particular day and we learned that his name uh, is, is on a list and that he was told that his name is on a list of infidels and that he needed to be careful several of the other boys have also heard that they need to be careful or else. Hakim has left the country three times because of, for safety reasons and in each of those instances we have enough information to know that he, he might not have survived unless he had left the country. 